Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back Dana Bash of CNN and Senator Joe Manchin to the stage. Hello again. Senator Manchin, thank you so much for doing this. Thank you for having me, Dan. As somebody who has um, trailed you in the hallways <laughs> for many years, I know that, that this issue is, is, is near and dear to your heart and you're somebody who's actually trying to do something about the debt and not just talk about it. Um, which actually, I'd like to start with a broad question on that issue about how you even get to the table to, to have this discussion because you're also somebody who I find it such a unique um, kind of senator in that you were a chief executive, yeah. a successful one. You're used to getting things done, and the Senate is not an easy place for that. So what have you learned? Well, that is true. <laughs> what have you learned and in you know, the years that you've been there, and, and what are you thinking about going forward since you are going to run for reelection about how to tackle these issues in a way that's within the confines of the Senate. Well, people that haven't had experience before in government and come right to the Senate or the Congress, you understand they're not, they might not be on the same level playing field that all of us have had that experience. If you've been a former governor, and there were 11 of us at the time, uh, basically the first thing and the foremost thing we do every day of our, of our uh, executive responsibilities is to have a balanced budget amendment. We have to balance the budget. So we have people coming to us all the time. Once a week we sit down, they tell us what, what our forecasts are, what the domestic markets are, the international markets, our investments. We have to have a 7.5% return on investment management portfolio and on and on and on. Nobody thinks that way here. So first, I'll, I'll just give it to you, put it in perspective. When I got here, I first I said, okay, I says, uh, 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 what, how much are we going to spend? You know, what's, what's the budget? And they said, uh, they told me, we're going to spend about $3.4 trillion when I first came. I said, okay. I said, uh, so I said, what's our revenue estimate? Because all we care about is revenue. Uh, I, if I know how much revenue I have and I know I have to stay within those limits, I know what I can spend. So I said, what's the revenue? And they said, well, you understand, we've looked at it. We don't think we can cut anything out of $3.4 trillion. So after about the third time I asked the question, I said, I get it. I know you want to spend $3.4 trillion. I got that. How much do you think we have to pay for that? And it's all about 2.2. <laughs> and I said, do you not think you might be just a tad short? <laughs> and I said, where I come from, West Virginia, I said, you know, it's basic math. We can count. And I said, we've got to put, make things work. Well, it doesn't work that way in Washington. I don't, I, you know, I don't, they talk about funny math or fuzzy math or whatever, but, you know, math is math. You're 1.2. Somebody's going to pay. So... When you look at what's happened and you look back over the history, and then I heard about Simpson Bowles, and I got so excited, Dana, because mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I know, I know uh, Senator Simpson and I know Erskine, and they're really, we're going at it in a, in, in a way that needed to be tackled. Mm -hmm. But nobody took it serious. So I would tell you this. In political life, especially if you're an executive, whether you're the president or the governor or whatever, uh, you better not, you got two things you better not waste, a mandate and a crisis. President Obama got elected by a mandate, and he had a crisis. Well, the first thing you do, you can do anything you want once you get your financial house in order. But they went right to the big social issue and not to the big financial challenge. That put us behind the eight ball, and we never recovered from it. So you're saying that you think President Obama wasted his mandate and the crisis? And crisis. You do? You take advantage of crisis. Oh, my goodness. That's when you get things done. He came in at that point in time, you know, and we're looking at, what, uh, the trillions of dollars we had. You know, if you look back to 1997, we had not balanced the budget from 1970 to 1997, not had a balanced budget. So under President Clinton, Democrat, Republican-controlled legislature, and John Kasich, they were able to balance the budget. Started in 97, they put the, put the new uh, tax codes in place, 98, 99, 2000, 2001, and had spun off surpluses. We would have been public debt-free by 2006. That's CBO. You need to read the CBO reports, which nobody pays attention to. And if you read the CBO's report, it tells you pretty much, you know, what was going on. The Congressional Budget Office in January 2001 stated in their budget outlook, the federal budget over the next decade continues to be bright and will build on a period of historic surpluses. Now, 1997, we were $5.7 trillion in debt, 1997. He says, and in 2006, they said adding the surpluses accrue as projected 
much of the nation's current debt will be paid down. And in 20 and 2006, debt, debt held by the public will reach a level at which the remaining debt is not available for redemption. If we'd have stayed on course. Now, however, just a year later, the CBO changed their tone, projecting that long-term pressures on spending and decreasing revenues due to legislative changes in the tax code, which was 2001, 2002, would set the country on a path toward deficits as long as laws remain unchanged. And here we are in 2016, they're unchanged and we're at 19 trillion and growing. Now, uh, you obviously were critical and have been critical of the president for not doing more at the beginning of his term, but you also mentioned Simpson Bowles. Um, that was another, op another opportunity for the president to seize on a solution and Congress, not just the president, oh, and yeah, Congress. No. And it didn't happen. Yeah. Well, let me just say this. You, would, might, you might say that uh, in 1997, Bill Clinton, President Bill Clinton at that time, it might have been the desire of the Republicans. If it had not been for a willing participant executive, right. president, it wouldn't have happened. I don't care what you say, the, the executive sets a tone. And when I was governor, if I wanted to get something done, I had to make sure that I would, and everybody around me had to make sure I was totally committed to it. Once they know it, that's that I'm committed and has a deep burning desire to do this, you can kind of bring people together. You're, you're an influential member of President Obama's party. Like, did you call him on the phone and say, let's do this, man? Well, I, I haven't had that much conversation because we had some differences on other things. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I, his heart's in the right. I mean, uh, that's not going to be, you know, that wasn't on their front burner, I don't think. I would have just, I would just say this, any new president coming in, if you have governors that are sitting mm -hmm. in the body of Congress, bring them in. Say, how, how'd you guys work through some, we all had problems. How do you work through it? And no one ever can. No, your phone never rang. No one ever conversed with us and never asked us. And we had, I think, right now we have five Ds and five Rs and one independent. I don't think any of us have gotten called. We have a governor's, former governor's caucus. And uh, I think we have a lot of insight and input that we could bring into the bring to the table. Mark Warner's made a gallant effort, as you know. Uh, Saxby Sambles at that time, they put, had the Gang of Eight trying to do. We worked together. We used to have 30 people at caucuses. See, to me, this is the, the, the ultimate illustration of how Washington is just not working. Well, let me just tell you, the, the biggest problem that I see right now, how could we get out of this mess? Yeah. And there's, there's, I've got friends on both sides, and on, on the Republican side I'm working with in this. I said, first of all, we've got to get a global tax rate. Get a competitive global tax rate. Do you agree we should be competitive? Yes. And then should we have a corporate tax rate first that basically is competitive? What's the global quote, corporate tax rate? And it averages anywhere from 23, 24, I, I hear back and forth. So let's say we pick the 25, 26 figure, and we get rid of all the junk in the box, and then you basically do a territorial. Where do we stand revenue base? That's what they look at, and, and, and CBO will score it, and they'll say, oh, we can't do this or can't do that. But we can't score dynamic growth. Dynamic growth is basically confidence, and I'll, I'll give you this. I did something when I was, in the first 100 days I was governor, I privatized workers' comp, which no one thought could ever be done. It was the greatest obstacle we had in West Virginia. And then, uh, well, then we did uh, insurance reform, we did tort reform, we did tax reform, we did some things that just made us competitive. And by doing that, our economy took off, 25, 26, 27, 28. We were still going like this in West Virginia when the, most states were going this direction. So I asked, we missed the projected revenue estimates by almost 10% the first year. We had a, five, uh, uh, a $500 uh, million dollar surplus, I mean $500,000 surplus. And that's something you don't, in state government, you don't want. You want to be pretty much on your estimates because your legislature lose confidence. They think you're trying to snooker them. And uh, so I called all the people in. I said, how did we miss that? You guys have been the best at forecasting. How did you miss it? And they said, Governor, we couldn't, we couldn't factor in confidence. And I said, what? And they said, the people in West Virginia had confidence. You and the legislature did things they never thought could be done. People start investing. They start spending. They start getting up off their their cans and getting off the sidelines and got involved in the game again. Mm. So I know what dynamic growth will do. We don't score that. So taking that out of it. Mm -hmm. So I said, well, if we get a competitive tax, global tax rate, corporately and individually, one that we believe is fair and one that I believe everyone should participate in to a certain extent, 
With that being said, at the end of the day, let's say we spin off a trillion dollars or half a trillion dollars. We all agree on a base, and then we, because of the growth, we, we spin off more money. A lot of my Republican friends will say, wait, wait, wait that's, new, that's new revenue. That's like a tax increase. Mm -hmm. So they want to reduce the rate more. I said, come on, guys, get real. How in the world do we pay off any of our obligations? 19 trillion. So I said, why don't we agree on this? As the Republican, you hold Democrats' feet to the fire and say, no more entitlement expansion, none, okay? And as a Democrat saying to the Republican, okay, we're gonna stay on this path and we'll use 60 cents of every new dollar for debt reduction to 65% of debt to GDP, the other 40 cents will go in infrastructure bank to rebuild America. Can you go home as a Republican, defend yourself? Most of them said yes. Why can't we come to some agreement? It's not, it's basically what's revenue? So what's the answer to why you, why well, the answer, you gotta have, have an executive. Room. You gotta, Take us in the room. You gotta have an executive that'll step to the plate and say, boom, okay, Erskine Bowles, Bowles and Simpson. They came to, they got 11 out of 18 votes. You had five Republicans, six Democrats that voted for Bowles Simpson. Mm -hmm. I would have taken that and called that my own and ran all the way home with it. I, I just don't think it, was anybody, it wasn't on the executive's agenda at that time. Now, I'm, I'm just saying. Do you think it's misplaced priorities, or do you think that, in fairness to the president, he had a lot on his plate? Oh, an awful lot. My goodness, you have to give him that. He, was, he had a crisis. But a crisis was around money. Yeah. <laughs> if you have a crisis around money, you fix your money problem. Uh, here's the thing. We're going in, we're gonna have a new administration, right, next year. I would think that Hillary Clinton, if she looks and if it's up close and personal, understands the greatest legacy her husband left. And, when, and I don't care what setting you're in, when Bill Clinton's introduced, whether it's Republican, Democrat, mixed crowd or whatever, this is the last president. The last president that gave us a balanced budget with a surplus that we could have been debt free if we'd stayed on course. That's a heck of a legacy. I've never heard anybody else introduced that way. Now, with that being said, I think she gets it. I really do. Donald Trump, I would hope, that would understand and you get it also. You know, you just gotta hope. Um, what about Donald Trump on this issue? Um, you know, he suggested maybe to renegotiate U.S. debt if the economy crashed. Would that be something that you think is a good idea? I I, Basically, to, to, you know, to, like a he, business, you, let the, you sure, let the dead. I'm sure he looks at everything as a deal. Right. Okay? And a lot of people do business that way. They get to the point to where they owe, them so, they owe you so much money, you're willing to take anything to keep alive. I understand. I'm, I've been around long enough to understand the leverages that people use on each other. I don't think uh, the standing, good standing that we have in the world leader that we are, that you could play with that. I just don't believe that. I don't think you need to. There's other ways to do it. The thing that where Donald said something about, I think, eight, eight years he would balance the budget. I don't know how, I mean, I'm all for it. I'd sign up, as a Democrat, I signed up for balanced budget amendments, and I don't care how long or how short of time that period it's going to be, but when you think about it, we were 5.7 trillion in 1997. We thought that we would have been, our public debt in 2006, that was nine years at 5.7. We're at 19 trillion and growing rapidly now. I don't know how those numbers figure up in eight years that you're gonna do that. Um, you uh, are Senator from West Virginia. Mm -hmm. There was a primary there yesterday. Oh, it was a rough one. Why? Well, I, I just think that people, I mean, here's what, I, the people of West Virginia are just the hardest working people and they probably uh, sacrificed a lot more given this country the energy it's needed for the last 100 years and there's no one saying thank you. I, I, I say, West Virginia. You're talking about coal? I'm talking about the energy that we've produced, and mostly in the coal industry. But it's just like you know, our, our veterans returning from Vietnam. It's almost what it feels like back home. And here are people that have done anything and everything you've asked. It's been so important for our nation that President Truman had to order, enter into an agreement with them in 1947 to guarantee their uh, uh, benefits from the UMWA. And now they're about ready to, you know, their health care is about ready to fall apart. But I look at that and I'm thinking, how, these people, they just want to work. If you're going to use, and you can't run the country without fossil for the next two or two and a half decades, I'm all for renewables, I'm for everything. But we have, this administration didn't have a plan to take care of all the loss of jobs that would happen in such a accelerated manner. So 
not only are West Virginians sitting there, so what happened to me and why did it, why did it happen? But I don't think anybody really cares. I don't think anybody cares about it and says, well, good riddance, you know, it's just awful. Yeah. So that was the backlash you saw from our, from our elections. You know, our, uh, our business correspondent, I heard her say on the air this morning, uh, Christine Romans, that what we saw in West Virginia last night was the uh, income inequality and despair over that on steroids. It, it, that's, I, I can't even describe it. I've known, I've born and raised in coal camps and I've known people all my life and people that I love dearly and I've never seen people hurting so bad and so upset and so mad to think that this administration, this country's left them. I really, I, I mean, it's just, it's, a, it's, a, it's heartfelt. It just makes you, makes you sick. And, and then you had uh, Hillary Clinton who uh, said, we're gonna put a lot of coal miners and coal companies out of business, but in fairness to her, what she was trying to say, and in the next sentence, which gets cut off a lot, was I knew that wasn't in Hillary's that heart. She, I, yeah. That, yeah, that she that she says, but we need to take care Can't of the behind. people Can't that you were behind. that you were talking about. But you know, when it comes to the sentiment about the president, which obviously he's not very popular in your she state, got, she but, got the and about of that. she couldn't. Yeah. There was no way probably to recover from that. But the bottom, when I talked to Hillary about that, I knew it wasn't in her heart. When she said it, I about dropped over, and I saw it on television. Sunday night in Ohio when she made that statement. I think, was you talking to her? No. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll talk to her if you can arrange an interview. <laughs> we, can, we can work on that. <laughs> anyway, uh, and I knew that. So I'd called President Clinton and we talked and he said, Joe, I'm, let me work on this. And Hillary called me and we talked and, and she said, that's just, it came out wrong. I made a mistake mm -hmm. as I spoke. And I know sometimes what you have up here and what you have here. Oh, believe me, I get and that. And I told her, I said, I said, Hillary, but really there's no, mistake in what you spoke and that's the way it come across we're going to, have to deal with this she didn't have to come down to west virginia she didn't have to go down to the coal fields the most depressed areas and she knew it was going to be hostile and she says no i want to go she said i owe to those people know how much i care about them and i want to help them we're talking about plans that work but basically if, if you're going to give tax credits or we call them extenders we try to we try to uh, uh confuse you by calling a tax credit or a giveaway program of your dollars <laughs> as extenders so you'll know the lingo that's used up there. Anyway, uh, so if you're gonna give extended tax extenders or tax credits, and it's gonna be an energy field, such as renewables, don't you think they ought to use those tax extenders to be used in the areas where you lost the jobs? I can tell you, a coal miner can build anything. They can rebuild your car before you leave the parking lot. They can do it all. Give them a chance, they don't care what they build. They'll build you, they'll build you uh, solar panels, they'll build you windmills, they'll build you anything you want. Just give them a chance. But you can't just say, listen, we don't need you no more. We don't like you. We don't want you. Forget about you. Discard you and take off and go somewhere else. So I have a lot of hope and faith in Hillary, understanding and knowing them as well as she, no one knows West Virginia better than Hillary, that I believe that's, that's the chance that we have to help the people that have given so much to this country. You are a, a conservative Democrat, one of the few left on the planet, maybe. <laughs> um, oh, come on, there's a few of you out there. And, and, uh, and Hillary Clinton, whom you uh, endorsed, got creamed by a Democratic Socialist in West Virginia. Explain why. Oh, I wish I could. <laughs> Craziest thing I've ever seen. Why? If they were mad at her about her energy, what she said, mm -hmm. they must not have listened to anything Bernie. Bernie's leave it in the ground. Leave it in the ground, Bernie, by God, touch nothing. You know, uh, my friend Brian Schweitzer said one time, he says, unless you're naked living in a tree eating nuts, by God, you use energy. And I'm not sure if Bernie's people are, you know, or what they believe or what they think, but Bernie would shut it all down. But he's so just that, a vessel that of their anger, not been, right? That's not, that's not what, you hit it on the other. It's basically income inequality. Mm -hmm. People believe they don't have a fair shot for the American dream. And Bernie's given that fair shot. He just can't pay for it. I'll give you a perfect example. Bernie and I, and I know Bernie, I think he's a great guy and what you what you see is what you get and what you hear is coming from his heart. So he believes it. I said, Bernie, you want to give free education to everybody? And I said, let me tell you what I did. My son, my son went to school the first year. I paid for it the way he thought you were supposed to. I go to visit him. He says, boy, Dad, I sure do like school. And I said, how are you doing, honey? He says, oh, this nightlife is really good. <laughs> so I knew right then I Sounds had a problem. Right. <laughs> so the first year he flunks out. And I said, okay, Joe, we tried it your way the first year. We're going to do it my way this year. You want to go borrow the money. You're going to go borrow the money, you're going to go to school, you're going to get your degree, and if you graduate on time, I pay it all. Mm. If you don't, it's yours forever. Guess what? He graduated in three years. 
I said, Bernie, that worked. I think it'll work. I says, let the people borrow the money that need them to go to, you know, we want everybody to go to school. No one should be denied. If they go and get a Stafford loan, we guarantee it, which we do anyway. I said, and if they take a full load and graduate in four years, we pay for it. They've earned it. You got something. But I guarantee you, let my son go. He'll enjoy the nightlife as long as you pay for it. <laughs> that just, but that, it doesn't resonate with Bernie. Right. That, doesn't, that doesn't make sense because there's been too much corporate welfare. So he's trying to balance corporate welfare with, I'll just give more away over here. And, and I just disagree. Were they just taking out their anger on the president, on Hillary Clinton? Because she did so well in 2008 in West Virginia. Uh, they really, she was his opponent. Let me tell you, in the general election, it's going to be brutal. In West Virginia, it'll be brutal. For Democrats. I think Donald will win by anywhere from, I would forecast, he'll win West Virginia um, by at least 65% of the vote. Well, that actually uh, brings up my next question, which is the exit polls last night, not surprisingly, um, back up what you said, you know your state really well, that over a third of people voting in the Democratic primary are going to vote, they say, for Donald Trump in the general election. And do you think that West Virginia is, is unique because it is such a hostile place to, to Washington, we're particularly bit, the, the, the Obama administration? Or do you think that this is a potential problem for your party in yeah. Pennsylvania and Ohio and other, other Rust Belt? I think ours is probably the hottest of the hot places right. you could be in the country right now because we got hit so hard. Mm -hmm. We got hit uh, by the Obama administration, and Democrats got wiped out in 20. 14, for the first time in 83 years, our legislature switched in, in uh, West Virginia. We went to a Republican control both houses, the House and the State Senate. That hadn't happened in 83 years. Um, and I'm the only Democrat in Congress out of five. So we've never seen this before, the dynamics. But, but, but broadly, a little bit more broadly, and, and on the issue of income inequality and populism and, and kind of tapping into the anger that people fear, feel about not being able to, to, to get ahead or even stay afloat um, with their family budgets. Do you worry as a Democrat about Donald Trump continuing to get those voters who could sure. potentially be Democratic voters? Absolutely, I worry about it, but I can't change who I am. And, I'm, and you know, I mean, there's still a, a, an element of caring, compassion. I, see, I, I describe myself, I'm fiscally responsible. I'm not going to make you pay for something that doesn't make sense and I can't explain it just because I want it for my political posturing. So I'm fiscally responsible, but I'm socially compassionate. But I'm compassionate and I come, and most Democrats in West Virginia came from hardworking families. They helped each other, and if someone couldn't take care of themselves, they would take care of them. But they expected you, by God, to get off your rear end and do something. And we'll help you, but you've got to help yourself. So it was a kind of, I don't know, we're just not Washington Democrats. So looking forward to the, the general election and staying on the, on the, on the issue of you know, income inequality and um, what Washington can and can't do, and the message that you think your candidate, Hillary Clinton, should use against Donald Trump to try to counter what obviously appears to be quite powerful uh, with people, what, what, what is I your think, suggestion and I your think she, Hillary will be much more articulate in her plan of how she's going to basically reinvest in that area so people can live in that area and make a living and take care of themselves and their family. Nobody else is saying that. You know, coal's going to be, there's going to be a certain amount of coal needed to run this country for the next 25 years. That's even by the Department of Energy's estimates. We can do that and do it better than anybody. We have the best coal in the world. That can still be done. There's still a viable part of that segment of our society. We need to diversify more. We need to have some big investments in that. And it has to be done by tax I think somebody in tax incentives. I'm not saying throw more money at it. Just redistribute what you got out there now and make them use it where, it needs to be, where it's needed the most. Um, you know, this, this is such a great country, and we're letting ourselves get in the safe. You know, they've always said, if you can't keep yourself strong, you can't help anybody. I can make you all the promises in the world. I just can't pay for it. And that's what we're getting ourselves right now, and I'm just so scared of that. And I would like to see a step to the plate and forget about the politics and start worrying about the country. We're out of time, but I just want to end on a hopeful note, which okay. I'm hoping that you, you have one uh, based on your, uh, your decision, decision um, to run for re-election in the Senate in 2018 and not go back to being governor. That's got to mean that you think that there is some hope for getting things done. Well, you now, you about. can't judge that off of me. I mean, I enjoy being governor. Okay, governor's... But you want to come, my point is you want to come back to the Senate. Governor, yeah, I'll come back. I'm going to do everything I can.
Right. So, no, I don't know so people, I don't you know wouldn't people want presumably you wouldn't come back. You're not that much of a glutton for punishment. You wouldn't come back unless you thought there was well, a potential there's, there's, to get stuff done. Let's just see. You know, we'll, we'll make that decision starting next year. But we have a big election coming up. We've got a change in the Senate. It's going to, the, the Senate, I think, is going to change. The Democrat is going to, in the Democrat side, the caucus is going to change. Mm -hmm. We have Chuck Schumer will be our new leader, majority leader. We have some retirements going on, so we'll have some, some positions in our committees. There's a lot going on there, and we're going to see if it's going to be a little more broad and a little bit more inclusive. And uh, I've got high hopes for that. And the, the next administration, I've said this, whoever sent uh, the people of America to be our leader and chief, chief executive, I'm going to work with. Uh, I just can't subscribe to people saying, well, my, my greatest uh, job is going to be to get the person defeated. My greatest job is going to be to make, make America the best country in the world and be, uh, uh, you know, be the uh, superpower of the world and maintain that. So I still believe that you know, if we don't get it right, God help us, God help the world because the whole world's counting on us. Senator, thank you. Thank you, Dana. Appreciate thank it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.